On Denver's coldest day in decades, people living on the streets and in their cars filled the Denver Coliseum more than expected. Your generosity for those folks also more than expected. Almost $90,000 raised since last night. We'll look at how the future of driving might fare in the snow. All you can hear is the snow crunching underneath. And I love the, first I say, love the sound of crunching snow. Every four years, these friends have a date to get together somewhere in the world. And we'll look back on a cold case. Colorado's coldest took us a long time to crack. Come get cozy by our fireplace, because this is next. This is the kind of cold we'll tell our kids and grandkids about. The kind of cold Denver has not seen since December 22nd of 1990. It was 24 below zero at DIA, close to that cold downtown. The coldest wind chill reported anywhere in the state so far was a negative 54 out east in Sedgwick County. We saw a 75 degree temperature drop from yesterday to today. This is the type of killer cold that we have talked about, especially for people who are living on Denver streets. The Denver Coliseum is still open as an enormous warming shelter, and today the city turned the Wellington Webb Municipal Building downtown into another warming shelter. Trying to convince people to come in out of the cold yesterday was not always easy. It was so warm all day, and so it was um, it was difficult to convince people that that this was coming. Um, and then when it blew in so fast, um, you know, the temperature dropping, you know, 20 degrees in, in an hour, um, I think, you know, it was really when our outreach team, um, you know, started being able to transport people to, to shelters more, more quickly, because I think people then, you know, really recognized that it was going to happen. Denver planned to have up to 225 people stay at the Coliseum. The city says they ended up with 354 people there overnight. Then there are all the folks who had to work outside today. A lot of you pointed us to the ground crews at DIA out there in the negative 24 degree temperatures plus wind chill. They were bundled up good as they were hauling ice or hauling luggage and de-icing planes getting everybody ready for their holiday comings and goings. Surprisingly, did not want to find, uh, did not find airlines. I want to talk about that today. So I'm going to assume that you have heard the standard TV news tips for cold weather driving because you hear the exact same ones every year. Instead, we are going to transport you to the cold weather driving future. Electric vehicles. Our Steve Steger set out to learn how they do in this weather. I can actually set my car to start before I even come out. Forget about those puffing laws. Marlene Strickland says she can get her Ford Mustang Mach-E nice and cozy right here in the garage with the door up before she has to drive away. Even in this bitter cold and the drive in the snow isn't all that different from her gas cars of the past. Um, it actually does better in snow than my Dodge Durango did. The battery makes the car heavier. The weight is better balanced, she says. The only real difference in sub-zero temperatures is how far she can go on one charge. The range does drop about 30%. But if you think about your daily average drive, you're going to the grocery store, you're running errands, you may be going into work. It's a chemical reaction, so it, it slows down uh, the, how fast the electrons can move within the battery. Nigel Zeed is an expert in electric vehicles. They do well. They will lose some range for sure. Perhaps uh, not an expert in dressing for sub-zero winters. This is just how I am. This doesn't really bother me as long as my core is warm. Much like his legs, he will tell you batteries operate differently in the cold. Certainly it slows down, uh, just like your phone will lose more charge if you left it out now or, or a flashlight battery. But he also says you're never really driving the full range of your battery anyway. And if you do, you've just got to adapt to EV life. If you've driven 250 miles, aren't you going to want to stretch your legs, have a cup of tea, you know, have a, some biscuits or something? Sounds lovely. Both Nigel and Marlene are used to the questions. And if you're stopped in traffic, the only thing your battery is doing is keeping the car warm. You know, your, your seat heaters, your, it's very using very little battery. And they have tons of answers. The goal of what we have to do now is have to help uh, explain EV living to people because it is slightly different. One other difference, if you don't park your EV in the garage, Marlene says, it's not going to melt the snow off the hood when you turn it on. It doesn't get as warm up there. Bottom line, not much of a difference between gas and electric cars on a day like today.
To hear him talk about EV living, though, there are the subtle lifestyle changes that, that people have to make in terms of a trade off or going to the gas station. That's the big concern that they say so many people have when they talk to them. It's that idea of you only have 250 miles, 350 miles worth of battery per charge. But think about how much you use your car on a day to day basis. Like your daily commute's probably not 250 miles. And if it is, you're probably going to need a stretch at some point during that 250 mile commute when you need to kind of charge up and get ready for the next thing. How'd your e-bike do today, Steve? Uh, did not operate. No, uh, no, no, I, I oh. no. thought that gas, was an all weather vehicle. Gas no? car all the way. Got it. Got it. Got yeah. it. Burning those dead dinosaurs today. <laughs> keeping the e-bike at home. Thank you, Steve. There are Coloradans who we know are staying in motels on this frigid night, and that is an upgrade in their situation and it's because of your generosity. These are Coloradans who have been living in their cars lately, living in the secure parking lots offered by the nonprofit Colorado Safe Parking Initiative. And since last night, you have raised $87,000 to expand that nonprofit's work up and down the front range. A note from the nonprofit's director tonight said simply, your community is amazing. Yes, you are. We already knew that. Your latest Word of Thanks microgiving campaign is going to do so much good for people who are mostly newly experiencing homelessness and they're just trying to get right back into stable housing. Scan the QR code on your screen or text the word thanks to 303-871-1491 to get the link to join me and thousands of other Coloradans in donating to this week's campaign. This nonprofit provides safe places for people who are living in their cars to park. That along with warm meals and bathroom facilities for them to freshen up because they go to work. Because a lot of these folks are just trying to save a paycheck or two for a rent deposit so they can get back into a home. And the nonprofit helps with that too. Their latest project is a lot in Commerce City that is reserved for families with children living in their cars. The goal is for those families or anyone really to only be with them for a short time until the nonprofit's team can help them back into housing. And you are helping to make that process as safe and as comfortable as possible. Another 218 migrants arrived in Denver overnight. That is one of the largest one day increases we have seen over the last week. The city is using 220 more shelter beds for the migrants today compared to Wednesday. We hear from the advocates working with them. Many of them have come from Venezuela, applying for asylum, fleeing political persecution. There are 200 plus more people that came in overnight needing shelter on that brutally cold night. The day after the mayor said the city at some point is going to hit its limits in resources. We do know the number of churches and nonprofits are stepping up to help. Do you know a migrant? a refugee or anyone who is forced to flee persecution. If you don't know one, you certainly know of one. He's arguably the most well-known person ever walked the earth. He's depicted in many a manger scene seen in our homes this time of year. He was about two, the story goes, when his family fled to Egypt to avoid being killed by their government. This is not a show about religion, but it is a show about people and how we treat each other, how we treat the migrant, the refugee, the stranger. That has been a question people have wrestled with for all of human history. The recent arrivals of migrants into Denver is just the latest line in a story that began millennia ago, so long as there have been parents willing to do anything to give their children a better life. As long as there have been people lucky enough to live in the place where others dream to go and have had to decide what to do with those who show up on their shore or at their door. Migration, movement, is the story of human history. The circumstances change, the names change, not Jesus this time, but often Jesus. It's not Herod, but Maduro who's sending families fleeing. Even if you have never read the book, you know the story, you know a migrant. Lawyers for Denver based Dominion Voting Systems are getting some admissions out of Fox News hosts that we did not hear them say on air that they knew that the big lie about election rigging with this company in Denver was totally made up and they did not believe it. The details came out in court this week as Dominion sues Fox News for $1.6 billion. Lawyers for Dominion say they have sworn admissions from people like Sean Hannity and Tucker Carlson who pushed the election lies. Hannity, for example, admitted under oath he didn't believe the lies about Dominion for a second despite what was said by him and others on his show. Dominion's defamation lawsuit is scheduled for a jury trial in April. Hey, may I make a recommendation? Something that did not come from us, but I think it is worth your time. 
It's yet another thoughtful reckoning by a Republican in Colorado who is torn over whether the Republican Party is something worth saving. Sage Nauman is, is not a name that, that you know, but we know in our business. He helped run Joe O'Day's uh, failed Senate campaign. Before that, Sage was the spokesman for the Colorado Senate Republicans. Good guy, smart guy. He writes in a recent column, quote, Donald Trump is antithetical to conservatism, full stop. Nauman also says, quote, I find myself disagreeing with the direction of the political party that I have devoted my entire adult life to advancing, but I try to do so with disappointment, not disgust. Sage Nauman's column on why he plans to remain a Republican, if only to make a final, perhaps futile stand for conservatism, is linked on the next Facebook page. On the coldest day in Denver in more than 30 years, we throw it back to the coldest day in Colorado ever. It was, it was just plain colder than Billy Hell. It was a mystery. It took us years to solve on Next. Guys, terrible at staying in touch with friends. These guys see each other eh, at least every four years. They're back to talk about it next. Well, it was really cold today. So cold, in fact, that our high temperature heading to the single digits in the negatives. Minus 7 degrees. That was our high temperature for today in the Denver metro region. Down towards the south and west, not as bad with temperatures being in the upper 30s and lower 40s, but the majority of Colorado was in the freezer. That wind chill warning, it lasts up until tomorrow morning at 11 a.m. Wind chills as low as minus 40 degrees. Another very cold night is something that we have in store for us. Currently, wind chills in the uh, negative teens for uh, Greeley and as you're pushing out towards the north and east. Same thing goes for Pueblo and Trinidad. These are extremely cold temperatures. Stay inside for the rest of this evening. These are dangerously cold conditions. Clear skies for us right now as overnight low temperatures are set to drop back down to around negative 15 degrees for us. High temperatures for tomorrow in the middle teens. Much warmer than today, but it's not going to be warm by any stretch of the imagination. And as we head from tomorrow morning into tomorrow afternoon, maybe a little bit of mountain snow possible. Otherwise, things are looking mostly clear. High temperature of 16 tomorrow, much warmer on Saturday with a high temperature in the upper 30s and lower 40s. Back in the 50s on Sunday and Monday for Christmas, of course, nearing 60 degrees though on Tuesday. I love that the day with the lowest zero is breezy. <laughs> That's good. I like that. So today's coldest day that we've had in Denver since 1990, obviously far from the coldest day ever recorded in Colorado. So seems appropriate on this throwback Thursday. We toss it back to 1985, the start of a cold case that we on next tried to solve and failed a couple of times. So February 1st, 1985, up in the tiny town of Maybell, west of Craig and Moffat County, negative 61 degrees, not wind chill, temperature, negative 61 degrees. So for years, we on Next tried to find the answer to a simple question about that day. A variety of locals up there have given us varying answers on whether or not they had school that day. I understand that people in Northwest Colorado are tough, and like to talk about how tough they are, but come on now, school in negative 61 degrees? I'm obsessed with finding this answer. I have scoured old newspapers from 1985 to see if they've mentioned it, talked to people who lived up there. I think tonight we have perhaps the most definitive answer yet. Moffat County Schools told our Corey Reppenhagen today they're pretty sure that all of the schools in Moffat County, including Maybell Elementary, were in fact closed on September 1st, 1985. Throwback to the old fireplace set there. So with that, back in 2021, we thought we had it solved. Case closed. Well, then we got some new info explaining why we heard different answers from different locals. It, David Van Zandt, he was the assistant superintendent of the Moffat County School District, finally cleared up for us. Your brain gets frozen, I think, and uh, uh, you know, time just, Time kind of melts the years together. I remember from that day that we did have school, it was, it was just plain colder than Billy Hell. And uh, the, I, you know, when you say, did the kids come to school? The parents used their own judgment. If they, if they were some of the ranching kids that weren't coming all the way in, I don't think they came in, but school was open says school is open. So memories are good. Written proof is better. And we've eventually found it. A newspaper article from 1989 on a day that the district 
did close school. That made news in 1989 because the newspaper noted that Maybell had not closed school several years earlier on the coldest day in Colorado history in 1985. For 30 years, they've traveled to different continents chasing the World Cup. I got a question then for Brian. Brian, how long are we gonna do this? Good question. And the most Colorado thing we saw today is something we see anytime it snows, but in this cold, why? That's next. Some of your holiday joy you've been sharing. Isn't it wild that so many of the old pictures seem to come out perfect when they had like one or two shots at it? And here we are today taking a thousand pictures of our kids and they all look horrendous. Anyway, so soccer is a world's game, you know. It's also a decades long connection that's taken two friends from Colorado around the world and back. Back now from Cutter. Our Brian Wendland caught up with them. It's been called the best World Cup final ever. And while that's just an opinion, two Coloradans can objectively say it was the best they've seen in 28 years. From a soccer standpoint, there's no question. You know, the noise uh, was deafening. And, J.B. And Belzer and Brian Crickham have been to every final since the World Cup last came to the United States. We were fortunate enough to uh, go to the World Cup final in 1994, um, thanks to J.B. Belzer. And it just uh, it went from Let's get to a game to a bit of an obsession that uh, has lasted a long, long time now. An obsession that's taken them to Europe, Africa, Asia, and South America. You just get caught up in, in, in the cultural experience, the learning, the getting immersed in, in um, other cultures and being able to find out things about parts of the world that you would maybe never see otherwise. Four years is a long time, and a lot changes between their quadrennial World Cup trips. We, we grew up coaching the game against each other and then watched each other succeed in the collegiate game, and, and now Brian in the professional game. And it is that measuring stick. It's that inventory once every four years to gauge your progress. Plans are already in the works for their 2026 trip, and travel will be a bit easier with the World Cup coming back to the States. And for these two friends, a journey that started in 1994 isn't going to end anytime soon. I got a question then for Brian. Brian, how long are we going to do this? Well, I guess you're probably going to have to, to dig me up and put me in a seat at some point, but uh, we'll probably just keep on going. For next, I'm Brian Wendland. Brian's just a few weeks away from training camp with the Colorado Rapids. JB's getting ready for his third season coaching the University of Colorado, Colorado Springs women's soccer team. Hey, the most Colorado thing we saw today required some courage or some foolishness or a combination. That and your feedback next. The most Colorado thing we saw today is somebody who is trying too hard. Give it a rest. Let the everyday running streak end. You don't need to do this. Our Jeremy Hole has spotted this runner out for a jog with temps nine below zero. It is pretty Colorado though. You see stuff like this, send it to us next at 9news.com is the email. A lot of feedback tonight about the discussion about the biblical story of migration and how it might relate to today's headlines. A note from Reverend Dr. Mark Lee of First United Methodist in Fort Collins who says this preacher was both impressed and grateful. Less impressed was a viewer named Steve Farner who wrote in to ask, just curious, are you doing your share, taking them into your home, financial support? After your sermon, I'd like to match your contributions. Well, Steve, I know you're just making fun of us, but assuming you're not a liar, I'll look forward to your contribution to next week's Word of Thanks. Stay tuned for that. <laughs> 